picture, it's interesting that it says at the end, speaking of King Asa, King Asa became sick in his feet. And in his sickness, he inquired of the doctors and not of the Lord, and he died. Nothing wrong to go to the doctor, but your trust is still in the Lord. And it says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. And I can just imagine how God in a moment knows everything. Nothing is hidden. To show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And he says of King Asa, in that you've not done well. In that you've done foolishly. And therefore from now on you shall have wars. Now it's interesting when you speak to the Lord about a loyal heart. I said, Lord, sometimes our hearts are not that loyal. That word can be an undivided heart. Fully, fully committed. Blessing flows out of commitment. I shared this morning when we as a group of men were going to go somewhere. Uh, one guy said, I just want to take off my ring. I said, sir, you planning to cheat your wife? No, 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 no. Just don't tell my wife. I said, why do you want to take off your ring? I said, if you are a man of two minds, I don't know if I can be friends with you because you're a double-minded man. Yes, but, don't but. You've chosen your love, love your choice. Be loyal. And that's what he's saying. God, his eyes are moving and he's looking for people whose hearts are committed and he will strengthen you. He will empower you. He will carry you in whatever you need. He's looking. But if your heart is undivided, the opposite will be true. Let's close our eyes. Thank you, Father, that we can have undivided hearts, knowing that we have a God who wants to bless us. We receive the seed that people are going to give, Father, whether they put money in, whether they put it in electronically, in whichever way whether it's a debit card. Father, thank you that we can bless the seed. And sometimes, Lord, when we're at home, we don't have the facilities in church. Then it's when we are committed to really give. And then you who see in the secret will reward openly. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The ushers can take up the offering. And we have debit card machines in the foyer if people want to pay in that way. We're just going to see in the first service our uh, week's roster didn't work. Let's see if it'll work now. It's nice to look at a few pictures in quietness. <laughs> but if we can just quickly run through that uh, our Funanani volunteers, we have an evening where... If you are interested to serve there and to volunteer there on the 5th of February, um, 1900 hours in the chapel hall, which is on my right-hand side. I'm sure you know that by now. We have a new members meeting next week, Sunday, the 10th of February, after the service in the conference room. I would like at this moment in time just to extend my welcome also to our first-time visitors here this morning. Is there any first-time visitors? Can I just see their hands? First time, you're the first time with us. Oh, a lot of them. Let's give them a warm welcome this morning. And with that, we also want to invite them afterwards. We have a visitor's lounge just next to the cafeteria. The head deacon for today will meet you there if you have any questions. And uh, we would gladly answer that. And it's so glad to have you as part of this congregation and this family here this morning. Looking forward to having a cup of coffee with you afterwards. Then the Israel tour, as you've seen, uh, seen on the screen... Uh, Afrikaans tour on the 12th to the 21st of October, English tour on the 24th to the 1st of Novo November, deposit payable before 30 April. There's more info on the website. It's important that you please let us know so we can see the Afrikaans group the size and the English group the size if you can respond in the meantime and just give us an indication who of you would like to go there. Then our World Vision uh, feedback, um, I think we're going to let that stand over until we have sound again on, the, on our system to give you a full feedback on what's happening. I can just tell you that the Lord is blessing us at the moment with the people that we have out in the field. Keep on praying for them, supporting them, and I know that they stand for the vision that the Lord has given for this congregation. 
Very important, last week we asked you humbly for people to volunteer with Christ Kids to help with the kids on Sundays. Otherwise, we have capable men and women like Leon and Jackie who really uh, is going to burn out. It's not possible for two people to look after 120 children. And I'm delighted to say today, last week we had eight volunteers who went out and said, here's our services. And I just extend this again to the people here this morning who wasn't here last week. We desperately need your help. Let's call it crisis on call for the kids. If you can just give your name afterwards, fill in a form at the foyer. Uh, Leon will contact you. What basically happens is if there's a need on a Sunday, Leon can pick up the phone and say, we have a need this weekend because of a special service. Could you please stand down one service sitting in the auditorium and come and help us there? I realize if we have 40 such people, we have the whole year, volunteers right through the year, and you might miss one or two services just helping us with the children. I really would like to count on you for that. So if that's on your heart, please just leave your details. Our car guards, if you feel in your heart you want to contribute something to them, please do that. You are free to do that. Although we ask people to really pray on how they give and what they give, because in that sense we have control over what's happening here. And uh, the last thing today is um, we were so blessed last week. We started off, we started off with new groups in the church. Um, we're looking at cell structures. Um, sh soon in April we're going to have a real men, real women Friday and Saturday which is basically our English congregation, the camp and I know there's a new thing that the Lord wants to do this year so I'm going to ask Marlene just to quickly run down on what the, the ladies has decided to do this year thank you Marlene thank you Mario, good morning everyone um, I'm very happy to announce that this year we're launching ladies interest groups for the congregation. The main aim for this is to um, just focus more specifically on different um, groups of ladies and the needs. Those who have the same interest to come together, fellowship and grow together. So I'm very excited to, to invite you to that. Now, for that to be successful, we need your input and we need your brains, man. So um, I want to invite you to uh, information sessions which will be held on the 26th of Feb, the Thursday the 28th and Tuesday the 5th of March. Um, we get together, we are going to discuss the interest groups, we want to see what the needs are, how we could structure it so that everyone will benefit from this and then we'll roll it out from there onwards. So I desperately need your help, please would you come. In the foyer, if you have not received a leaflet like this containing the information and the dates, please take one in the, at the information desk. Ladies, we need to stand together, so come, please. Thank you, Mario Marlene. I just want to mention that tomorrow morning, Stephen and I fly to Zimbabwe. We're teaching pastors and sharing with pastors the whole week. Just be praying for us. We start on Monday right through until the weekend, and we're honored to be able to go and impart something of what God has taught us. Today I want to share with you number five in our series on mountains. And we're going to look at the Beatitudes. Every year when I'm in Israel, I'm blessed because on the side of the Sea of Galilee, there's Capernaum. And above Capernaum, is where they believe the Beatitudes took place. It's like in the form of an amphitheater. Today you can't get in there because the farmer who, who owns the ground has planted stuff there. But when we could still, years ago, I stood at the bottom, and you can speak to anything from, you can speak up to 30, 40,000 people if they sit on the side. And I would speak with this voice tone, standing down there, and they would hear every word. And it's interesting that when you go there and you experience that, it's just something of what the Lord wants us to understand. Not that we have to go to Israel to experience the Lord, but the Beatitudes speak to me of where Jesus comes and he paints a framework, a framework of primary attitudes of people that have received the kingdom of God in their hearts. You see, when, when I'm married, I, I, have a, 
I have to leave my mother and father. Now we have to build our own home. And the Lord says, I'm taking you into my kingdom, and I want to teach you what your attitude must be in my kingdom. At rebirth, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, and he wants to teach us those principles of God's kingdom. What a wonderful teacher, the Holy Spirit. He wants to teach us concerning the attributes that he might establish in our lives. What is he looking for? I call this the manifesto of the kingdom of God. Coming into the kingdom, I have to learn new things. In this we find a call, firstly, to humility. The Lord calls us to humility. Proud people are not teachable people because they're always right. A willingness, secondly, to suffer persecution for the kingdom of God. When you start serving the Lord, surely in some or other way, there'll be a form of persecution. We don't experience much of this in South Africa. But about five years ago, they invited me to Johannesburg. And there were a group of Muslims that had had an encounter with the Lord. They came for a learning experience in South Africa. And part of what I was privileged to do is to spend a whole day on teaching them on the person of the Holy Spirit, praying for them for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And a young man of about 26 came to me and he said, Sir, will you pray for me? I said, for what? He said, they were hanging me up on my fingers eight hours a day, telling me to denounce Jesus. Pray for me when I go back. If they hang me up again on my fingers, that I will not denounce the Lord. And I thought, how easy it is in a free country. Yeah, this man suffers persecution. There are more people being persecuted in the world today than ever before for their faith. But the willingness, thirdly, to give heed to his commandments, especially the big commandment in Galatians 5.14. The commandments are summed up in this. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now in going to Israel, there are things that confuse me. And when I say that, I want you to understand, on Shabbat, you have a Shabbat elevator. You're not allowed to press the knob. All the knobs are pressed, so it stops on every floor. But if the power is cut, you can pull the door open and walk up the stairs. You can't push it open. So I was saying to this one man, while he was pushing the pram, I said, Sir, if I can't push the knob and you can't, why don't you pull your pram? You, you can't push it, sir. You must pull it. I, I don't understand that. See, I don't understand religion that doesn't make sense. And I don't believe God wants us to get involved in things that don't make sense. He said to me, no, no, no. You can't do it in the elevator, but you can, or you can pull, push the plan, but you can't push the elevator. So I said, help me. I don't understand how you reason in terms of what you may and you may not. So in a sense, you're never sure, am I breaking a law or not breaking a law? Am I guilty or not guilty? So the Lord comes, he says, all I want you to do is to love people. Not instead of yourself. First love yourself, then love people. He's teaching them this. Then fourthly, to stand, not to stand in false righteousness. To stand in false righteousness would mean I pray, God, thank you that I'm not like this person. God, I go to church. God, I do this. And this poor sinner will beat his chest and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Fifthly, to make prayer a way of life. In this manifesto, he says, I want you to make prayer a way of life. In the sixth place, to attach more value to spiritual things than earthly things. I don't know what drives you. If there's a driving force in you, you've got to buy something. You need deliverance from that. With men, got to have that car. 
with wool and plastic, got out their shoes. You know that designer line. Whatever it may be, he's saying, make spiritual things more important. And then in the seventh place, above all, to acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ by being obedient to his revealed will. I'm, I want to, Lord, I understand this, I want to do it. His Lordship must be established in your life. Now, are we shy to serve the Lord? I've shared this, but this young Muslim girl in Cape Town really stirred me. 16-year-old, she'd come and put down her mat and pray five times a day. Then she had an encounter with the Lord, would come bring her carpet to school. Five times a day, she'd pray to Jesus. Then they said, no, you can't. She said, but as a Muslim, I could. Now as a Christian, I can't. I don't understand your standards. Isn't there religious freedom? See, we, we have to take a stand. A stand, and that's what the Lord's saying. Acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus in your life. Now, in the Beatitudes, Jesus explains to us that things like position don't count. I battle with people that want their titles. When Pede Leroux dies, he's got Uncle Pede on his, on, on, the, on, on the memorial the thing that they have there at the funeral. This guy phones, he says, uh, I want to come to the funeral. I'm Dr. Apostle so-and-so. Do you have special parking for me? Do we have a special entrance for me? And do I have a special seat with water? So he said, sir, we'll do it at your funeral. <laughs> you see, the Lord's trying to teach us in the Beatitudes. That's not the way we do it. Authority. Authority, who's the boss? A big thing we had in South Africa, who's the boss? I'm the boss, and I'm always right. Number two is, if I'm wrong, we go back to number one, I'm always right. The boss can be wrong. And, we've, and he says, your attitude must be teachable. Then he says, in this new kingdom, money doesn't really count. It's not... The money you have, it's the money that has you. If money doesn't have you, I can let you have billions. But if money has you, then you know, you're going to take, got a 200 rand note here, and it's got a leopard on. You're going to squeeze the tears out of the poor leopard. You don't get stingy money, get stingy people. See, it's just a commodity. And God wants to teach us that. Then he comes and he says, what he calls his kingdom, what is important is faithfulness and obedience. Just faithfulness and obedience. Jesus wants to show the religious leaders of that day a sincere obedience is much better than shallow keeping of laws and rules. Shallow keeping. That's why I said, I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm not going to give you all these laws, just one, love your neighbor. But what about my neighbor's wife? If you love your neighbor, you won't fiddle with his wife. If you love your neighbor, you won't take his car. If you love your neighbor, you'll humble yourself with a servant's attitude and give him preference. It's so made so easy, the manifesto of the kingdom of God. I honor God for the New Testament. It says in Hebrews 8, verse 6 and 7, But now, but now is a new season. He has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Then he says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. He wouldn't need a second. Now we start, go back to the Beatitudes. In Matthew 5, 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, he went up the mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying. Now the habit of the rabbi was to sit down as he taught the disciples. 
And I just imagine the rabbi would come and, and find a place and say, I want to sit down and teach you. I had a spiritual father, Peter LaRue. He'd take me by my hand and say, come and sit here. I want to teach you. Come and listen to a sermon. And he'd say, that was good. But who taught you that nonsense? I said, but it's not nonsense. He says, you mix the old with the new. You can't do that. You're trying to live in a new covenant on Old Testament bread. And I'd say, teach me. You see, that's the rabbi had to teach. But the teaching had to be more than what I taught. It had to be a walk. This week, the Lord showed me an interesting vision. I saw people with traps around their ankles. People with big, like, you know, bare clamps. And I said, Lord, why are people in trouble? He says, because they run ahead of the shepherd. And the enemy has wiles. He has traps. And the traps catch them. If they waited, the shepherd would have broken all the wiles that the enemy had set. Don't run ahead. And sometimes you need to just stop and say, God, am I running ahead of you? Because I've got a problem. Now the first thought that comes to the surface in the Beatitudes is the constant repeating of the phrase, blessed. It's amazing. Makarios from the root muck, indicating a long duration. This is interesting. The Lord comes and he says, the word is also an adjective, suggesting happy and extremely blessed. But not like just once. Continually full of joy and continually blessed. So the Lord says, if you let me teach you, you'll be full of joy. You'll be blessed. Come, I want to teach you. I want to be your rabbi. I want to sit and teach you. Now the word is so clear. The Amplified puts it beautifully because we battle to understand it. It says, spiritually prosperous with life joy and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of outward conditions. What an, a mouthful. Now we start in Matthew 5, 3 with the first beatitude that he taught. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To be poor in spirit is not the same as being poor in earthly goods. That's not what he's talking about. Poor in spirit is a realization in your heart that you in, are in absolute need of God in your life. Blessed are you if you have such a need for Jesus in your life. Lord, I need you. Lord, I'm dependent on you. He says, now I can bless you because you're dependent on me. Blessed are you if you have that need in your life. And you realize that you can only be rich and strong in the Lord through faith. I feel rich and strong in you through faith. There's no other way. There's no title, no position, no special favors, no name dropping. Just favor with the Lord. Faith believes in the blessing of God regardless of circumstances. I believe God. You're going to take me through. Oh yes, the enemy has stolen from me, but you're going to provide for me. Now we as human beings are not strong enough to stand on our own. We're just not. We need his help. That's why he says in 1 John 4, 4, in the Amplified Bible, little children, you are of God. You belong to him. You've already, past tense, defeated and overcome the agents of the Antichrist because he who lives in you is greater than he who lives in the world. That's incredible. I've shared this story, but I just want to go back. We were just a year old living word. Made an altar call in the service. We were in the old uh, Cinerama Theater. About 15, 16 people come out standing in front. Remember this one guy, handsome man, dressed in black, rings on all his fingers, black hair. And when I come and stand in front of him, he starts shaking. Everything in him shakes. Looks like he's going to lose nuts and bolts. You know, it's like a car shaking. I said, what's wrong with you? He says, I don't know. 
I said, but when I stand in front of you, you shake. He says, yes. I said, where do you come from? He says, I'm a warlord. They sent me to kill you. And he had a big knife stuck in his trousers. I had to stab the knife in your heart in front of all the people. He said, I've got eight covenants with the devil, blood covenants. I'm one of the strong warlords. He said, but I said, my God, I understand this. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We needn't live in fear. We needn't live in fear that, oh, that person is going to harm me. The greater one lives in me. There's an authority that comes forth. Someone who is poor in spirit is unconquerable. He, if you believe that God is on your side, you must believe what God says. Perhaps you might lose a round in the faith fight, but in Jesus, you're a winner. I love that. You know, in Jesus, I'm invincible. Hallelujah, I'm invincible. Man, I've got a problem, but my God, the problem will not overcome me. I can imagine, I don't know if you've got a strong imagine, big three-meter Goliath standing, small little David saying, I'm invincible. And Goliath saying, come on, you know, we eat your kind for breakfast. <laughs> but it's not David, it's he who is greater living in him. In the second place, Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is a very interesting scripture. The word mourn refers to a strong desire. Blessed are those who have a strong desire, a yearning, a longing for that which you do not have in Christ. I have a yearning for, for more of the Lord. And that is to have my life fashioned to the image of Christ. That in everything I do, I can portray Him. It also means that my heart breaks because of certain attitudes in my soul. Attitudes that make me petty. Petty about nothing. I just touch on a thing. Who put in the toilet paper? It must go over the top, not under the bottom. Who didn't put down the seat? Are we like that? Petty. I'd, the guy says, until I got married, I never knew toilet paper had to go over the top. <laughs> we petty. Petty about nothing. We narrow-minded. We egotistical. We proud. And it says, when you mourn, God, I'm sorry. I, I don't like this attitude. I, I get upset for nothing. I get upset for just nothing. Unlike Jesus, you're heartbroken to really see what's in your heart. Now you can be comforted by the Holy Spirit. Out of your desire for more of Jesus in your life, you open your door or the door to the Holy Spirit. I need help, Lord. He says, okay, I'll help you. I'll show you that thing as a root. I'll help you. I'll strengthen you. I'll empower you. I'll advise you. But comfort includes Psalm 116, 15. This is the Amplified Precious. Important, no light matter is the sight, is in the sight of the Lord, the death of his saints, his loving ones. I stand many times at a coffin and I'm sad. But you know, when the Lord gave me this scripture, it so changed my life. I said, you know, you're precious in God's sight. And here is just your body. You were the Lord now. And I saw something. I saw something because the Lord comes to Joshua. He says to Joshua, Joshua, Moses is dead. Like, yeah? Moses is dead. Joshua, now go over the Jordan River. There's a land ahead of you. I want to say to you, if you've lost a loved one, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of that loved one. But they did. God says, I've got a new day for you. You can't. I sat with a couple. Ten years ago, their child got killed. They can't. 
I said, tell me what's happening in your home. They said, we don't talk to one another. We fight. We don't sleep. We cry. I said, what kind of a life? Your child is with God. You'll see one another one day. Precious in his sight is that death of that loved one. But God says, I'll comfort you. But then it's time to put on a new garment, a garment of praise to get over that. Blessed are you if you mourn over the part of your life that does not yet fully portray Jesus. Blessed are you if you mourn over that. God, I get so upset with my husband. Always does the same thing. I married 39 years this year. 39. My wife still doesn't close anything. Just puts the lid on top. So when I take it, the thing falls out of my hand and it breaks. Now I come and say, oop, my wife was here. Before it got me upset, now it doesn't upset me anymore. Just doesn't upset me. My wife thinks her car can run without petrol. So I don't let it upset me. I go and fill the car at night. So I'm just going to fill your car quickly. Now I've registered the car on my name, so I do the services as well. I sold her car, and she didn't do the last service. So the guarantee... I don't blame her. You see, there are other things she does phenomenally. There are other things your husband does phenomenally. Don't be petty. Mourn if that thing in your life is getting you upset. Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is not a weakness. People confuse meekness with timidity. Or just not speaking up for yourself. In Numbers 12, 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. Wonder how it was to work with Moses, such a humble man. Just a humble man. And to humble yourself means that God can, he says, watch that man. I'm watching him. I can strengthen him. Moses was strong in his attitude of obeying God. Obeyed God. Strong in that. I love Matthew 11, 28 to 30, out of the message. Are you tired, worn out? Come to me and get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I, want to, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. What an invitation. The rhythms of grace. I met a pastor down in Natal. He'd come into his home and it'd be upset. He'd say to his wife and children, Everybody, I'm with me. Mm. He said, let's just get on the same level. Mm. He says to his son, okay, you out of tune. Mm. He says, okay, will you deal with that attitude quickly? Yes, dad, I'm so sorry. Let's go home again. Mm. And they bring peace in the home. I love that brother. He says, I do it everywhere I go. Walk into the company in the morning. Everybody's fighting. He said, let's hum together. <laughs> the Lord wants us to live in harmony. Although Jesus said of himself, I am meek and lowly of heart. He spoke strong words. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He was willing to do his Father's will, although it would cost him his life. Luke twenty two forty two. It says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This one woman says to me, Neville, you don't understand my home. My husband always bosses me. 
So I said, next time he says, you go and do that, you say, darling, do you love me? He says, yes, I do. Do you think that'll be very good for me? Okay, I'll go and do it. He says, wait a bit, I need to think about it more. <laughs> you see, it's an attitude. We're not there to dominate. And if you're feeling dominated, you can act back in a dominated way. He wants to teach us. Now, at the moment, I need to understand meekness is my strongest faith to obey God. Meekness is your strongest faith to obey God. Meek means, God, what do you want me to do? I want to obey you, to think his thoughts, to do what his Holy Spirit leads you to do. And today, I want to make a confession to you as a congregation. I grew up in very difficult circumstances. My first years at school, they had arranged fights for me every day. The kids beat me up until I learned to fight. And, and I learned to fight. I had to, to survive. Now today when I have a problem, I tend to want to fight. When a car pulls in front of me, I see with my younger brother, he'll race past the car and put on brakes in front. So the guy will go off the road. We've got to deal with that kind of thing. It's like when a guy does something wrong, you, <clears throat> you stupid woman, you stupid taxi driver. You listen to people's commentary in a car. Man, I'm amazed sometimes. One guy driving along and um, a guy skips the robot and he starts cursing him. I said, and now? He said, man, that guy, you know, and he had all kinds of stories to tell. I said, do you think you're better than him? You've just been cursing him? Now, if you're going to reap what you're sowing, you've just said so many curses, they're going to come on you the whole week. But it's his fault. I said, sound like Adam and Eve. You know, we've got to deal with that attitude of our heart. And that's what the Beatitudes are about. Be this your attitude. Change an attitude. Now, I want to say that as you call on the Holy Spirit, I had to learn when this thing in me wants to do it my way, to say, Lord, help me. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's there. Fourthly, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Abraham is our father of faith, and we can learn something concerning righteousness from him. It says in Genesis 15, 5 and 6, I want to mention, we have notes available. If you don't have, you can always get when you go. Then he brought him out. God brings him out and said, Look now towards heaven. Count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to Abraham, so shall your descendants be. What a promise. He's got no kids. And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord. And he, the Lord, accounted it to him for righteousness. This to me is just incredible. Because the Lord comes and he says, Abraham's hunger and thirst for righteousness led him into faith. Then Abraham obeyed God in faith, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. I saw something I'd never seen before. He could now stand righteous before God, not because of what he did, but just because he believed. Faith is our key to a relationship with the Lord. I can stand righteously before the Lord. I want us to look at Matthew 5, 6 from another angle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness by faith, for they shall be filled. Lord, I don't want to have a right standing because of what I'm doing by faith. Thank you, Father. My kids, my daughter specifically, has a relationship with me where she trusts me for things. I've shared this testimony before many a times. My daughter turns 21. He comes, he says, Dad, I love you. No, kisses me, kisses mom. He says, Dad, you know, in a month, I turn 21. I said, yeah, don't I know? Kids don't turn 21 anytime, just once. He said, Dad, and I had a dream. 
I said, what kind of a dream? She says, I woke up and uh, have this dream because, Dad, I had a dream that when I woke up, looked out of the window, there was a purple corsa. And it had a big bow on it, big ribbon saying, from a mom and dad who loves their daughter. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Mom. I know you'll make a plan. When she left, I said to my wife, my daughter has got faith in her right standing before us more than we have in the Lord. We made a plan. You see, it's right standing. You can never earn your stand of righteousness. You get it by faith. Abraham's faith gave him righteousness before God. And immediately he stood in a right relationship with the Lord. I love Galatians 3, 9 in the Amplified Bible. So then, those who are people of faith, you'll allow me to mix up the tenses. So then, those who is people of faith. So then, those who will be people of faith. They are blessed. So if you is a people of faith, you are blessed. And if you are blessed, you is blessed. And if you is blessed, you will be blessed. Together and made happy and favored by God in partnership with the believing and trusting Abraham. I love this scripture. Say, man, God's going to bless me because I have a standing before him. Why does my daughter have a standing before me? She's my daughter. If she trusts me, I'm going to make a plan. If you believe the Lord, he'll make a plan for you. He'll open up a door. Now, you, can, you can't pray like you used to pray. You can't pray like a beggar. You have a new cloak. You have a cloak of righteousness. Remember the prodigal. The cloak was thrown away. You don't have that beggar's cloak. You've received a new cloak. You clothed with Jesus, the righteousness of God. This totally changes your way of prayer. Now you declare what God has done for you. You rejoice in that, thank you, Lord. You've made a way for me. Lord, where there was no way, you made a way. Where there was no door, you came on the scene and you became the door. Matthew 5, 7, number 5. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy is compassion for people in need. Now, if you look on all the street corners, they're beggars. They go next to the car. My wife gets livid if I help them. I said, why? She said, I'll show you the studies done. These guys have a drug habit. They come here, and we had to learn. We follow them. We find the food package under the, the highway, or they sell it. We buy them a ticket, then they're selling it in the queue for half price. We have to help people. So you've got to be led by God's spirit. But God says, all I want is, I want you to have compassion for people. Jesus does not specify the categories of people that we should show mercy to. I believe it compares to the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, 25 to 37. Firstly, they're the robbers who rob the traveler. And they, they have a, an attitude. What's yours is mine. And I'm going to take it even if I have to kill you for it. So we have people with that attitude. Then we have the Levite and the priest. They walk past on the other side. They say, I know you're in need, but you must have sinned to be in this condition. Why must I help you? What's mine is mine, and I'm not going to share it with you. Then we have the good Samaritan. He says, what's mine is yours, and if you need it, I'll share with you. I believe there's coming a time in the church where people in real need we will have a fund because they came, lay down money at the apostles' feet and we could say, do you have a need? Let's help you. But we don't want to unfix God's fix because there's a principle. If you don't want to work, you can't eat. So if I, you don't want to work and I help you, I'm unfixing the fix God's fix to fix you with. Neville, but, but I don't find work. How hard are you trying? I don't have a work permit. In South Africa at the moment, if you're from any other place, you can get a year work permit. You see, I can't unfix God's fix. 
had to learn that lesson. And it's not easy. So I say to people, I can't do it because uh, the Holy Spirit hasn't spoken to me. I used to have a, a man in full gospel business in his fellowship, Uncle Paddy Bosman. I, never, I learned such wonderful lessons. Guys would come and say, the Lord told me you're going to give me 10,000 rand today. He says, okay, I've got my checkbook. Let's write it out to you. Do I make it out to you? Now, you just tell the Lord to speak to me tonight. And when he's told you, he's spoken to me, come fetch your check tomorrow. He says, they don't pitch up. But if the Lord speaks to me, we give. Why? It's not ours. He's entrusting it to us. I've got to have that attitude. Now, anyway, we need to say, Lord, I want to sow a seed in that person's life. In the sixth place, if the ushers are ready to get the elements for communion, they can prepare. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Yeah, Jesus is speaking of a depth of purity in men's hearts. In Psalm 51, 10, David prays, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now David commits adultery. He then kills Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. But he says, God, create in me a clean heart. And he was called a man after God's own heart. So it was not his righteousness that gave him a pure heart. It was his calling on the Lord. And if our salvation, your salvation, is not heartfelt to this level, you won't be able to see God with the eyes of your soul. We sing the chorus, open the eyes of my heart. I understood this for the first time. You see, if I harbor something in my heart, I can't see because walls around me are built through bitterness, unforgiveness, hatred, through self-reproach, self-righteousness, offense. And what does it do? It builds a wall that cuts out the healing power of God, cuts out the grace, cuts out the love. But now, faith, your faith on the need to have a pure heart opens up a door for blessing. God, I want a pure heart. I want a pure heart. And remember, I just want to repeat, a pure heart is, Lord, I want to deal with the bitterness. I want to deal with this hatred. Neville, you don't understand what happened to me. Perhaps I don't. But if you don't deal with that, you will not be able to see spiritually. But that person hurt me. If you are here today, you've never been hurt by people. I was privileged as I shared. First week of December, to be in the president's office. He's never hurt me. I don't know our president. You know who hurts me? My family, my friends, my colleagues. They hurt me. My wife, my husband, um, your husband, your children, they hurt you. People around you, they hurt you. We've got to deal with that. If we don't deal with that, it builds a wall. People live separate. In ministry, we're amazed to, to find couples that, you know, how's your wife? I don't know. I haven't spoken to her for five months. I mean, I come on this one farm. I see the guy, how's your wife? He says, don't know. I haven't spoken to her for five months. His wife comes. I said, but she's pregnant. He said, we're not that cross with one another. <laughs> but they're not talking. That poor baby inside needs to hear daddy's voice speaking gently to mommy. They need that. So we've got to deal with those kinds of things. Okay. Um, I have a technical problem now and then. In the seventh place, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. To really make peace, you need a godly intervention. Because reconciliation then follows. If there's true peace, there's reconciliation. I want you to hear so if husband and wife are divorced, there must be peace. You're divorced from one another. Why fight and the poor kid becomes the rubber band in between? 
and you know, your, your dad's worthless. Don't say that. Don't say that. Or whatever negative things we're doing. God wants us to understand humility is strong in the kingdom. So let there come peace. But there needs a supernatural intervention. He's the Prince of Peace. And he's also the one who reconciles us because he became sin for us. So when that happens, peace, you call the true son of God. There can be peace in a company. Why? Because, now I need to just stop here for a moment. Sometimes there are two visions within a company. A person begins to develop a vision, let them go, bless them and let them go. It's two visions bring division. We need to be single-minded, single-hearted. And then you need to bless the person and let them go. It'll happen in every level of life. Because if that person keeps staying, constant friction. Constant. M Matthew 5 verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For this is the kingdom of God. If the worship team can come so long. If you experience persecution like the prophets of old, and you've learned not to hit back, you're blessed. Don't hit back. You see, Jesus trying to teach us the Beatitudes. Be this your attitude. It's inevitable, it's not easy. That's why when you're teachable, the Holy Spirit says, I'm here, I'll help you, I'll strengthen you, I'll enable you, I'll even give you the words. And then you walk up to a person you don't have anything to say. I shared that I've never had my dad ever tell me that he loves me. When I had that encounter in heaven, walked up to my dad, put my arms around my dad for the first time in my life. My dad got out of my arms, but something broke between us. You see, Jesus comes to reconcile us to God the Father. Hanging next to him are two murderers. One turns to him, and immediately there's a supernatural reconciliation. Today, you'll be in paradise with me. Trust God to do that. As you allow the Beatitudes to be this, your attitude, you find a complete change. That's why I said, please, don't pray for the president if you're criticizing him. Neville, I know what our president Zuma is doing wrong. Got nothing to do with you. The Lord said, you pray for him. You pray. I, with my experience standing behind him, I'm standing behind him, and you know, I'm thinking, what do I do? And the Lord dealt with me there. He said, how can you allow these thoughts? Who appointed this man? I said, God, Romans 13 says you. He said, then you will honor my word, and you will honor this man. I was humbled in that situation. And I can say honestly, after that, I haven't spoken a word of criticism. Just blessing. God, thank you. The hand, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord like water. And I believe in the Lord as the scripture says. So out of my innermost being come rivers of living water. Then the heart of the king will be changed by the Lord. And God's kingdom will be established in this nation. If we would understand, that's why, in going, I'm going to Zimbabwe. Do you think it's easy to pray for Robert Mugabe? I sat with an international advocate who came to church the other day. They're tracing Mugabe as the 10th richest man in the world. He's raped his country. It's for the people. But I'm going to his country, and I dare not criticize him. I pray that God will, in a supernatural way, intervene. That's why I say we're humbled to be able to go. I really want you to hear, that's not the gospel according to Neville. It's the Beatitudes of the kingdom, the manifesto of the kingdom. Pray for people in authority. Pray for your government. Watch what God will do. Thank you. Let's just be in the presence of the Lord as everybody.